After the uh, fiasco last week, we got here at uh, 3.30 this afternoon, been <laughs> here waiting, making sure we're on time, so uh, let's get started on the right foot. Let's do a review quickly from the book of Numbers. Um, locationally, where does the first 10 chapters of Numbers take place? At Mount Sinai. What's going on in those chapters in that time period? They're getting ready. Uh, getting ready to, to hit the road. And what's the behavior response uh, of the Israelites in the first 10 chapters? Obedience. Yeah, there's all the repetition. They did exactly as God commanded them or as, as Moses commanded them. So that's the first 10 chapters at Sinai, preparing to leave, obeying the instructions God is giving them. Okay. Where does 10 to 12 take place? On the road. Okay. Uh, they hit the road. That's right, on the road again. Um, and what's going on in those chapters, 11 and 12 in particular? Complaining, lots of complaining, okay? Uh, see if you remember each of them in order. The first three verses of chapter 11 is, we're calling it complaint number one. What does that complain about? Yeah, misfortune or adversity, okay? It's pretty general. What about the rest of chapter 11? What's the second complaint? Yeah, and what's specifically about the food? No meat to eat. No meat. That's the, my favorite passage about the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the, all that. Yeah. Um, what about the third complaint, which we briefly touched on uh, in chapter 12? Yeah, uh, Moses is, is challenged by who? Yeah, his siblings. Miriam and Aaron question, complain against, or oppose Moses' leadership, object to his leadership. And then um, where does chapter 13 up to 19 take place? That's where we are now. We had to remember the name of it. Not quite there yet. This is the second of our three locations. It's the wilderness of Paran, yeah. Okay. And uh, what is the fourth complaint that we talked about last Wednesday? In 13 and chapters 13 and 14. This is the easy one. This is the famous one. It, we call it a complaint. Maybe, you know, there's a better word for it. Yeah, they don't want to enter the promised land. Yeah, they're intimidated, fearful, don't believe and complain against God. Why have you taken us here to be killed at the hand of these giants in the promised land? So that's the fourth complaint. Uh, remember, this is at the bottom of your screen, your structure of numbers. Uh, that's the summary of the first 10 chapters, the preparation that's going on as the people are organized and counted and arranged. The duties are spelled out for the Levites, and there's various instructions about life uh, with the tabernacle in their midst and traveling through the wilderness. Okay? Then, as we said in 10 to 12, they hit the road, and as they hit the road, the complaints start coming. And so this is a chart that I've shown you several times uh, that marks out seven complaints, depending on how you count it. And the complaints have a nice kind of uh, symmetrical pattern to them, such that uh, the middle one and maybe the focal point of their failure is the complaint we talked about last week. Uh, the refusal to enter the promised land, the lack of faith and lack of trust in God, and the consequence of that, this is where the 40 years in the wilderness come from. Um, by the way, remember, why is it 40 years? Because they were exploring the, the land for 40 days. And so there's one year for each day that the spies were in the land. Uh, but this is the reason why uh, that whole first generation, everybody from 20 years old and up, uh, is going to die over the course of those 40 years in the wilderness. And it will be a second generation, their children, uh, that will enter into the promised land eventually. So, Yes, yes. So the text says that the 40 years is one year for every day that the spies were in the promised land checking it out. Yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of a Bible trivia kind of thing, but it's interesting to know. That's where the 40 comes from. All right. So last week, that's what we talked about. We've already uh, been through this. The spies explore in 13 and they give this bad report. In 14, the people believe the spies. They complain to God. Uh, God is ready to strike them all dead, but Moses intercedes and appeals to God's glory, to his nature, and uh, he forgives the people, and yet they are sentenced to die in the wilderness, which was kind of what they had asked for. They said, it's better for us to die in the wilderness. God says, go ahead, uh, have at it. 
So that's where we are now entering into chapter 15. We are not going to read chapter 15 because I want to focus our time on chapters 16 and 17. But here's the interesting thing. Look in your text there. Hopefully you're open to the book of Numbers. And so think about what just happened in 13 and 14. Uh, The people have rebelled. Not only have they rebelled again, but they've rebelled in this kind of worst possible way, refusing the promise of God to enter the land. God has said, you're all going to die in the wilderness. Okay, Uh, This is a low point to be sure. And yet, notice chapter 15, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land where you are to live, which I am giving you, then make an offering by fire. Isn't that kind of amazing? (laughs) That right here, after they've been told this whole generation is going to die off, the next word from God, literally in the text, is a message of hope and looking to the future, right? Things may seem hopeless. It may seem like we're never going to get there, but God says, no, I'm still going to fulfill my promise despite your faithlessness, despite your rebellion. I'm still going to do what I promised I would do. So when you enter into the promised land, which I give you, here's what you're going to do. To do, uh, we see throughout numbers this kind of interspersion of stories and instructions. We've already seen that to some degree. We saw all these instructions in chapters one to ten, and the stories in chapters eleven and twelve, and then more stories, and then here's some more instruction. We'll see this going forward. This kind of alternation, and I want us to notice that it's not accidental. It's not random. I think these instructions are uh, intentionally placed at certain points to match up with the themes of the stories that are being told. So in this instance, I think chapter 15 intentionally follows 13 and 14 for the reason that we've just stated, okay? Yes, they fail to enter the promised land, but God turns right around and says, but when I give it to you, here's the instructions for you. So there's a message of hope and God's faithfulness in it. We'll run through it real quickly. First 13 verses, there's instructions about drink offerings, Uh, They are like supplements to the sacrifices. So you'd offer an animal or you'd offer grain and you would pour out this certain mixture of a drink offering. And it says in verse 13 that this would be a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So uh, it's an anthropomorphism, um, if you will, to describe how these sacrifices would be pleasing uh, before God. By the way, uh, you can note Philippians 2. Paul describes himself as a drink offering poured out for the sake of the Christians and their service to God. Kind of an interesting place that he's drawing that imagery from. In verses 14 to 16, uh, the the law here in Numbers 15 stresses that the law and the instructions, the expectations for the sacrifices are the same, whether you're a native Israelite or whether you're a sojourner who, like maybe Ruth later on in Israel's history, agrees to join themselves to the people of Israel. Remember, Israel was supposed to be a light and drawing the people from the other nations to join them and to worship Jehovah. And so the law would be the same for a sojourner who would, who would, would join. The next few verses talk about offering the first of the dough. Uh, again, this is, a, this is looking forward to the abundance of the land. But when you receive the abundance, make sure you're offering the first of that to the Lord. So some uh, maybe obvious applications there. And then there's instructions for sacrifices and offerings related to a sin that is committed unintentionally. That sin still needs to be recognized. It still needs to be even brought out to the public and atonement needs to be made for that sin. Then uh, I say offering there, 30 and 31, uh, that's actually probably a, a, a written wrongly. Because in 3031, it talks about how the person who sins uh, defiantly or blatantly against the Lord will be cut off. And then actually there's an example of that and a man who is stoned in verses 32 to 36 for violating the Sabbath. And uh, that's a kind of illustration of the command that was just given, that when you blatantly, knowingly, willfully sin against the Lord, you are to be cut off because of your guilt. Okay. Um, And then maybe also related to that, there is this instruction about the tassels. This is interesting to me because we have this picture of the Jews wearing these like prayer tassels on their garments. And we might have thought of that as like a totally a man-made invention, but there's actually an instruction here in Numbers 15 about the tassels that would be worn to remind themselves uh, to remember, verse 39, the commandments that they are to keep, right? Um, And so that maybe fits in with the idea of intentional sin or unintentional sin. 
that seeing those tassels would maybe remind you not to sin in a way if you're just absent-minded, or it would be a reminder to not sin willfully if you are so inclined to do that. Okay, so assortment of laws in chapter 15 uh, related to life in the promised land um, and avoiding and atoning for sin. But let's get to where we want to spend the majority of our time here tonight in Numbers chapter 16. This is the rebellion of Korah. There's actually several, uh, maybe three stories, uh, different stories here in uh, 16 and 17 that all go together. But I want to focus on this first one. That's the first 40 verses of Numbers 16. So I'll give you the questions ahead of time, and then we'll read, and then I'll give you some time to talk with your neighbors about this, and then we'll share out. But the two questions, or three questions, are these. This is another complaint, another objection, another questioning from the people, okay? Specifically Korah and his uh, cronies, we might say. So what are the arguments that they make? What are their stated objections uh, against Moses? But as you read the story, what are the underlying motivations? You know, there's always kind of the, the spoken objection, and then oftentimes there's an, an unspoken motivation. So what are the arguments that they make? What do you see as the underlying motivations? And then, as we've talked about Paul's language in 1 Corinthians 10, these stories are us um, and a picture of who we are as God's people. So how are we guilty of the same sin committed here uh, by the people in Numbers 16? But let's read here and, uh, and dig in. Number 16, we'll read the first 40 verses of this chapter. Now Korah, the son of Ishar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took action. And they rose up before Moses, together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, chosen in the assembly, men of renown. And they assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? When Moses heard this, he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and will bring him near to himself, even the one whom he will choose he will bring near to himself. Do this for yourselves, Korah and all your company, and put fire, uh, sorry, take censers for yourselves, Korah and all your company, and put fire in them and lay incense upon them in the presence of the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the one who is holy. You have gone far enough, you sons of Levi. Then Moses said to Korah, hear now, you sons of Levi, is it not enough for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister to them, and that he has brought you near, Korah, and all your brothers, sons of Levi, with you? And are you seeking for the priesthood also? Therefore you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. But as for Aaron, who is he that you grumble against him? Then Moses sent a summons to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, but they said, we will not come up. Is it not enough that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to have us die in the wilderness, but you would also lord it over us? Indeed, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor have you given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Would you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Then Moses became very angry and said to the Lord, do not regard their offering. I have not taken a single donkey from them, nor have I done harm to any of them. Moses said to Korah, You and all your company be present before the Lord tomorrow, both you and they, along with Aaron. Each of you take his fire pan and put incense in it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord. 250 fire pans. Also you and Aaron shall bring his fire pan. So they took each his own censer, put fire in it, and laid incense on it. And they stood at the doorway of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. Thus Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the doorway of the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among the congregation that I may consume them instantly. But they fell on their faces and said, O oh God, God of the spirits of all flesh, which when one man sins... Will you be angry with the entire congregation? 
Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses arose and went to Dathan and Abiram with the elders of Israel following him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing that belongs to them, or you will be swept away in all their sin. So they got back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the doorway of their tents, along with their wives and their sons and their little ones. Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these deeds, for this is not my doing. If these men die the death of all men, or if they suffer the fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs, and they descend alive into Sheol, then you will understand what these men that these men have spurned the Lord. As he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up in their household, and all the men who belonged to Korah with their possessions. So they and all that belonged to them went alive down to Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. All Israel who were around them fled at their outcry, for they said, The earth may swallow us up. Fire also may come forth from the Lord and consume Oh, sorry, fire also came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. Then the Lord said to Moses, saying, Say to Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, that he shall take up the censers out of the midst of the blaze, for they are holy, and you scatter the burning coals abroad. As for the censers of these men who have sinned at the cost of their lives, let them be made into hammered sheets for a plating of the altar, since they did present them before the Lord, and they are holy. And they shall be a sign for the sons of Israel. So Eleazar the priest took the bronze censers, which the, man, the men who were burned had offered, and they hammered them out as a plating for the altar, as a reminder to the sons of Israel that no layman who is not of the descendants of Aaron should come near to burn incense before the Lord, so that he will not become like Korah and his company, just as the Lord had spoken to him through Moses. All right. So the questions are on the board uh, in front of you. I want you to turn and talk with uh, those sitting around you. What are the arguments, the stated objections made by Korah and his people? What are their underlying motivations? And how is it that we ourselves can be guilty of this same sin? All right, just one or two more minutes. If you haven't uh, started talking about how we can do this same thing, talk about that and uh, we'll wrap up in a minute or so. All right. Share out... uh, what y'all talked about here. Let's start with this. What are the stated arguments made by the rebels in number 16? Who exalted you, they say to Moses and Aaron. What else? There are, thank you, Brian. There are accusations of failure in leadership, specifically that Moses has or has not done what? Yeah. And what was especially kind of um, bold uh, about that accusation of you haven't brought us into the land of milk and honey? What else did they say? So I want to come back to that, Dan. Yeah, that, we'll, we'll come back to that. That's, that's part of this first argument. But what are they, what, remember what they said about... Well, that, that's right. They're the ones responsible. Not only do they say you haven't brought us into a land of milk and honey, what else do they say before that? All right, to the text, let's go. We had it better in Egypt. They say in verse 13 that Egypt was the land flowing with milk and honey. They say you brought us out of the land flowing with milk and honey. I think that's what that means, right? Um, and we haven't yet gone into this other land of milk and honey. That, uh, so there's a failure, uh, accusation of failure of leadership. Go back to, uh, to what we said earlier. They say, why do you exalt yourselves? Dan points this out in chapter 16 and verse 3. What do they mean when they say, all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves? What, what is their argument here? We're just as good as you to lead? Why? 
We are holy. What do they mean by that? We are holy. The whole congregation is holy. Every one of them, the Lord is in their midst. What are they getting at here? We're all God's people. God is with all of us, right? We're all kind of, you know, one in the same. We're all a holy people. We're all a kingdom of priests. What gives you the right to stand up and make yourself a leader over us? So that's their stated argument. They've accused Moses of failed leadership. But what are the, what are the underlying motivations here? What do you see either stated or unstated as the motivation behind Korah and his people? Jealousy, like it says. More on that or just leave it, leave it there. Ian, we can come back to you, Mike. Um, I, I would say it looks like power and control. Um, they're saying, well, I, I can do your job. I can do it better than you. And you're not leading us to the land of milk and honey. You're not giving us our, and you're not leading us to our promised inheritance. So I think I can do a better job. So what's to stop me from doing what you do and, getting out of here thank you power control mike said jealousy what else would you say about underlying motivations here for pride someone else heard another voice back here Brian, if you didn't hear, Brian says, uh, these are as old, the motivations here are as old as Cain, and they are the, uh, the same kind of root of every problem and conflict we see in families and societies and nations and so on. Pride, power and control, we can do your job better than you can do it. They're jealous of Moses and Aaron in their position. You take us out here and we're going to all die in the wilderness. Yeah, that, there's that short-term uh, or selective amnesia that we've talked about before, okay? Yeah, Albert. I propose they were mad at God but weren't brave enough or strong enough to intercede in regards to his judgment on them, and so they took it out on Moses. And um, I don't have scripture I can give you, but I just can't help but think human personality is that way as they take it out on those who aren't actually in charge. Sure. Th no, thank you, Albert. Yeah, they're, they're the ones that are visible that you can, you can see, you can, you can yell at them, right? Um, okay, so what about us? As we've said, Paul warns that, that we can very easily be just like these Israelites in the wilderness. Um, how are we? Have, how have we been? How can we be guilty of the same sin here from number 16? Say that again, Mike undermining leadership more you want to say about that or are you just gonna I'm a man a few words tonight so you said what i'm a man a few words okay. tonight so yeah the undermine yeah the undermining of of leadership I and mean, that's essentially what's going on here and are there ways in which we undermine or object to or complain against leadership uh even in the church um or in the family uh using the same sort of objections or arguments that Korah and his people make? You can draw the, draw the parallels, the analogies here to us. Okay, so Brian says that there, again, there's kind of two layers here. There's the reasons we give to try to rationalize the fact that we're really just being difficult or selfish or prideful or whatever that motivation is. Ian? Oh, sorry. I, I think we can be guilty of this in two ways. The surface level way to me is what you're talking about, where we can point to someone in a position of authority and say, I could do a better job, or I don't agree with them, and why are they in control? But I think the underlying issue is they're not, they're not recognizing who really is in control and the blessings that they do have um, the real blessings that they have, that they are dwelling with God, that they are God's chosen people, that God has delivered them. They're forgetting about all that, and I think we can be guilty of that too. We can say, we want more of the land of milk and honey. We want our inheritance, and we look at that as a physical thing as opposed to the spiritual reward that we already have. 
Thank you, Ian. Uh, let's go to David. And then, was there still someone over here? Maybe. I kind of didn't dwell on the uh, the physical parallels between like authority and leadership on this earth. I was thinking more of my relationship as a man with God, and where I um, I mirror these sentiments. Maybe perhaps when, in any way, shape, or form, when you question God's authority or sovereignty. Even if it's, and this is where it's difficult, it's not perceived as arrogance, but it may be perceived as sort of a lamentation of like, God, where are you? Why aren't you here? Like the kind of give me a sign kind of cries and um, why, why haven't you done this? Or why, why is your yoke perceivably not as easy as I thought it would be? Um, or whatever that is, insert. It's like you're questioning his authority and his control and his uh, preeminence over your life. And that's where I see that. No, thank you, David. And then uh, as we're getting over to Albert and then Mike, uh, just reiterate, I mean, Brian said it's the sin that's as old as human history, essentially. And what David has described is, is the sin of Adam and Eve saying, I know, God, you've said this, but really I think it could be done better. So I'm going to do it my way. Albert? So just, I speak on my behalf. I try to speak on others, but I think of my, my growth, my immaturity, my growth, my immaturity, and my spiritual well-being you know, how many times have we heard sermons of, it's, it's not, are you saying to yourself, I don't get anything out of the sermons versus I'm putting everything I can into the sermons. I'm not getting any, any of the song leader always chooses this and the, the, the prayers are this length, you know, so we just, we, we, it's about us and, or it's about me and I've been growing and maturing and trying to, to get that out of myself. Thank you, Albert. Mike, and then we'll give Brian the, the last word before we move on here. There's a lot of stir in the pot that went on here also when we're talking about undermining leadership. It what just, just, was, just wasn't the three guys. <laughs> now you see why I'm short speaking. Tonight. <laughs> it wasn't just the three guys. I mean, they got 250 to go with them. So they were stirring the pot behind the scenes once they had what they felt like was enough power then they took that forward. Can we learn from that? Sure. As far as stirring the pot's concerned, if it's something with the elders going behind their back to talk to people to try to get our 250 all in line before we uh, uh, go against them. I mean, yeah, there's a lot that can be learned from stirring the pot behind the scenes, behind the leadership. Thank you, Mike. And then while Brian's getting the mic, uh, we haven't had time or opportunity to point it out, but actually that's a, that is a common thread through several of these complaints and numbers, that it's a small group that gets a bunch of other people riled up and they're complaining against God. A lot of lessons to be learned there. Brian? I think in part, or perhaps even in total, people have a misimpression of leadership in that they think God gives authority and power in order to lead when in fact what God is really doing is giving you responsibility to serve and therefore grants you the power, the authority to enable you to serve. I've seen too many people in the workplace that all they seek after is power and not service. And when they do, your life becomes miserable. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, Moses was the meekest man, uh, he says of himself, probably not, but it's written back in uh, Numbers 13, or Numbers 12, I guess, that we saw. Um, and I have to wonder if at some point in all of this, especially in this story, Moses is thinking to himself, sure, have it. Take it from me. I don't want it anymore, you know? You, yeah, you could be in charge. That sounds great. I'll just, uh, I'll step back, right? Uh, but yes, as Brian says, it's a misunderstanding of, uh, of the, the whole, what it's all about, right? Um, so let's, real briefly, I talk, a couple things, just kind of synthesizing and summarizing what y'all have said, then we'll move on to the other two stories quickly in 16 and 17. Um, I do think this is relevant. So I just real quickly try to, you know, point this out as an analogy to our, our time. This argument that they make that, well, we're all God's people. We're all given gifts. We're all given God's spirit. Therefore, we should be able to do what you're doing. You hear that a lot today. I mean, the, the, just think about New Testament, think about the leadership that God ordains for the family, for the church. There are distinct roles that he has given, right? Whether that's between men and women in the church, whether that's the outlining of the elder's role, the deacon's role, there are different roles given to different people. Today, you hear a lot of this, well, everybody's holy, right? This person or, you know, this woman can do the job just as good as this man. That's probably true. She could probably do it better, right? 
Or, you know, well, who's to say that I can't, you know, do this? I'm gifted. God's with me. The God's spirit's with everybody. And it confuses this issue of, yes, God is with everybody. Yes, God's spirit dwells among all of his people. But God has outlined specific roles and responsibilities and his wisdom far beyond us. Right. And those roles need to be respected. Um, And you see that Moses, part of Moses' response in verses 9 and 10 is to say, this is from the ESV um, translation. He says to them, is it too small a thing for you to have this responsibility that's given to you? And that, that's something that, that we don't want to miss. Back in uh, verse 1, it says that Korah was of the sons of Kohath, of the sons of Levi. The Kohath, the, the, the family of Kohath, the son of Levi, that, that clan, it said early in the book of Numbers, They had this responsibility to take care of and to protect and to transport the Ark of the Covenant and the furniture of the tabernacle. I mean, what a distinguished and beautiful and awesome responsibility that they were given, right? They had an important, and Moses is saying, is this not enough for you? Don't you see the value and the beauty of what God has ordained for you to be busy about? And again, I think the same thing could be said today. We are often discontent and say, oh, I want to do the big thing, or I want to do the, I want to be the guy that's up front. I want to be the person that's making all the decisions. Okay. As we have already said, as Brian points out, first of all, that's a kind of a misunderstanding of what leadership is, that it's all about calling the shots and being the powerful one. But we don't appreciate oftentimes what Moses is saying here, that whatever role that we have uh, to do, right, is a beautiful and amazing and and a powerful role, valuable role that God has given us. And let's not uh, despise the day of small things, using the language of the prophet Zechariah, right? Um, let's not discount what it is that God has given us to do, because each of us have an amazing and, and wonderful part to play in all of this, okay? Uh, we talked about their uh, amnesia, about Egypt. Um, notice in verse 26 and 27, God is again going to destroy all of them. He says, y'all, you know, Moses and Aaron, you guys step aside. I'm going to get everybody but Moses and Aaron again intercede for the people, and instead it is, the, uh, it is the, the rebels themselves. By the way, not even their children. If you go to chapter 26, 10, and 11, it says that the sons of Korah did not die in this punishment. Um, and so the, the ones particularly you know, responsible for the rebellion are killed. But their bronze censers that they used before the Lord... Um, live on and are plated to the side of the altar of incense to be a reminder to God's people going forward. Okay? All right. Uh, Real quickly, the rest of chapter 16, picking up in verse 41, we won't read it, the last 10 verses of the chapter, say that the people actually the next day uh, kind of keep going with this rebellion, even after uh, the Lord has swallowed up Korah and Dathan and Abiram and, and their people, In the earth, the people come out the next day pointing the finger at Moses and Aaron saying, it's your fault that all these guys died, if you can believe it, right? And so again, uh, God is ready to, uh, to strike them with his wrath in verse 45. There's some beautiful language here, though. Moses in verse 46 says to Aaron, basically, act quickly to make atonement for the people. So Moses and Aaron's first reaction is to, is to atone and to intercede again for the people. And so Aaron takes his censer he, uh, and the incense. He goes out and it says in verse 48 that he took his stand between the living and the dead so that the plague was checked. It's a powerful image of this plague kind of moving through the people. And Aaron goes out there. I mean, this is the picture of the high priest. This is the picture of Jesus ultimately going out and standing between the death, the dead and the living and being that barrier to atone for the people. And even still, it says in verse 49 that 14,700 people die in this plague uh, as a result of the kind of carrying on of the rebellion the next day after Korah and his people died. And so then finally in chapter 17, just 13 verses God uh, gives a sign that he hopes will minimize the grumbling of the people. You may remember this. uh, One leader from each of the tribes brings a rod, and Aaron is the representative from the tribe of Levi who brings his rod. Aaron's rod buds and blossoms and produces ripe almonds overnight. 
And so that is God's sign of choosing Aaron as his family, being the, uh, being the, the, the family of the priesthood, whom he has chosen to lead and to represent him on behalf, uh, re- represent the people on his behalf. Uh, what was I looking for here that I wanted to point out? Just went out of my brain here. Oh, in verse 5. God says, uh, I'm going to do this thing, thus I will lessen from upon myself the grumblings of the sons of Israel. And then in verse 10, it says, uh, you know, put this rod in the the tabernacle, the testimony, in the Ark of the Covenant, eventually where it goes. It says, that you may put an end to the grumblings against me so that they will not die. God is hoping to to give some kind of sign, again, as if swallowing up the earth uh, wasn't enough, a sign to minimize the grumblings of the people. But this story ends in verse 12 and 13 with the people in um, a fit of, of panic, right? We are, we are perishing, we are dying, we are dying. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord must die. Are we to perish completely? This is the question that we're left with after the story of Korah and his rebellion. It seems like, in their mind, anytime someone tries to come near, they are killed. Well, of course, that's become their, their, because they're coming near in rebellion and in pride, right? Um, but the answer to their question, are we to perish completely? What's the answer to that question? No, it may seem like it, and all the adults are going to die out in the wilderness, but they will not perish completely because as we started with uh, today, God will continue to be faithful to them and, uh, and take care of them and fulfill his promise to them and to the next generation, Okay. All right, um, we just have five minutes left, so I was hoping for a little bit of a discussion. Um, let me introduce this idea, and we'll have two or three minutes if you have any comments on this. Y'all may have talked about this before I got here last week, um, but I did want to at least come back to it and touch on it. It strikes me that in the first ten chapters of Numbers, the people obey all these instructions that God gave them. Here's how to arrange the camp. They did it. Count the people. They did it, right? Here's how to cleanse the camp of defilement. They did it, right? And yet, when it came to, they actually get on the road, and they are called on to trust God, and to have a joyful attitude, and be thankful, they fail miserably. And it occurs to me that, again, we are really no different, and that it's, in one sense for us, easier to obey the instructions that I've heard one person called checkmarkable. I know that's not a word. But things that you can hear and you can do and say, yeah, we did that. We came on Sunday, we sang, took the Lord's Supper, dropped a check in the plate, right? Heard a sermon. And we can check those things off the list. They're external instructions that I can see that I did it. Other people can see that I did it. But when it comes to matters of the heart, being grateful, for what God has given, not complaining when I face adversity in my life, not grumbling about leadership decisions that I don't care for, trusting God when times get really uncertain and very difficult in my life and I face some sort of personal adversity. Those are a lot harder for some reason. Um, And uh, that's, I think, one of the things to reflect on and to maybe mull over from the book of Numbers. So any thoughts on that? Any responses to that? Steve, go ahead. Uh, I do whenever I lose power at the house and that power doesn't come on for two days and I'm thinking this is pretty rough Uh, and then three days and then four days and then five days and you begin to start coming up with all kinds of issues that you can think of that have to do with power powers that are outside of your control and you get angry and it builds up in your mind and if you watch that little app thing with uh the i don't know it's the the ring app and you see the people and the complaining and the grumbling and the carrying on and the fit throwing that's going on I think as, as, and look, nobody can argue with the fact that where these two million people were was not the Garden of Eden. Okay, it was a difficult situation to begin with. And and I I just think that it began to build and build and build and build and build in their mind until 
They just got to the point where they couldn't take it. COVID was another example of that. So yes, I do believe that things external uh, that are around us, whether they be in the church or whether they be in business or whatever, uh, can really have a huge effect upon your attitude uh, of heart um, to the situation that you're in and uh, what in the world you're going to try to do and take within your own hands to rectify it. Thank you, Steve. All right, Mike, short of speech, Ryan, you're the last word. Well, if you like Steve, then you go out and you buy a generator to take care <laughs> of all that. But uh, I know you did. I know you did. Uh, but it's, they, moved, they moved out of their comfort zone, and that's one thing that is tough for us to do. Once we get outside of our comfort zone, then that's why we start having all these doubts and all these, what's really going on here? And uh, as soon as they left the camp at Sinai, that's when the problem started. Uh, as soon as the power went out, that's when the, because we're moving outside of our comfort zones. So we need to be particularly aware that once we move outside of our comfort zones, that these type of things are what will, what will pull, us, pull us down quickly. Yeah. No, thank you, Mike. Easy in the camp more difficult on the road. So that's a kind of a synopsis of where we've been so far in numbers. All right, we're going to pick up with 18 next week and hopefully get through chapter 20 because uh, I'd like to do another one of the narratives, um, which is in chapter 20 of the water. Real quick, don't go anywhere yet, Albert. Where do chapters 13 and 19 take place? Paran, yes, thank you, Cecilio. Um, let's go through, uh, not all the complaints. What's the complaint of 13 and 14? Chapter 13 and 14. That was not tonight. If you, this is a trick question here. This was last week. Complaint of chapters 13 and 14. Promised land is too intimidating. We're just sticking here with the wilderness of Paran section, the second major section in numbers. So 13 and 14 is promised land is too intimidating. What are the instructions in chapter 15? Not all of them in general. What are they about? Drink offerings, offerings, life in the promised land is maybe uh, is one way to generalize that. Um, and then what was the complaint of chapter 16 and 17? Yeah, complaining against the leadership. And I think that's all I had there. Thank you guys. Appreciate your uh, good work tonight.